Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Quest for the Best Director podcast. My name is Matthew Moore, and joining me is a guy who has never left his kids at a brothel, Caleb Ferguson. Caleb, what's going on? Oh, I'm doing just swell. How are you? Well, I'm good. Swell is a weird word. I don't think we use it enough. It's a good one. I feel like it shouldn't mean like a good thing. You know what I mean? Like swell, to swell, swollen. Anyways, oh, yeah. no, you're like swelling in your heart, like your heart's like uh, filled with oh. happiness. I see. Yeah. Anyways, I'm all right. I wore a beanie today, and everyone made fun of me. Oh, whoa. I don't know about a beanie, dude. It was very self-conscious. No, well, I usually look good in beanies. This is a different beanie. Mm. A bit too big of a beanie, I think. Anyways, yeah. Caleb. Beanies are hard. Finding well, um, talking before his introduction. <laughs> Shut the fuck up, Derek. Who I even if I'm harsh to him sometimes, Caleb, I would never pay to have people come in and um, pour water, alcohol on him, and kiss him, and throw him around. I would never do that. Wait, a yeah. little known fact: uh, the yeah. audience, the audience might not know this, but that's actually what it's like back here in the studio. We're in a cave. Yeah. Matthew is the overlord. He just whips us. <laughs> Make me the podcasting machines. Making so much money for me right now, it's insane. Especially Derek. Anyways, he's big time. He's Derek Trosinski. Derek, what's up? Not much. Had three exams today. So I'm wow. It's literally, like, not that far into school. This is my second week of school, so it's, like, mind-blowing that... I know it's not your second week, but mine already had three exams. Like, homework start being due. You need some recognition, dude. You're really giving it all up for the pod. I know. <laughs> Audience, give this man a hand. I'm a pariah. I They're do. all clapping in their homes. Yeah, I can hear it. It's so loud, I can hear it from here. Yeah, like, ev- like everyone's small directors can hear like this crazy clap. Like, oh, what is that? It's like, oh, just, you know, sound travels a bit slower. But Anyways, this is the Quest for the Best Director Ever podcast. Each week, we pit two directors against each other. And this is the last week of each director's fifth best movie. Which is very exciting. I know Caleb was complaining earlier about how he doesn't actually know any of the really good movies because he's only been watching everyone's fifth best movie. Mm-hmm. But this, um, we were is, watch we watch David Lynch's Elephant Man and Jean Luc Godard's Two or Three Things I Know About Her, which I think has to be the longest director movie combination at least the first round, <laughs> like in terms of the length of the title and length of the name. But um. Yes, yeah, so we're going to watch, talk about each of these movies, and at the end, we will decide which movie is better and which director will move on in our bracket. If your favorite movie does not make it, no worries. We'll have a loser's bracket. I'm still figuring out, but I'm getting closer and closer to actually having something that I like. So, <laughs> anyways. Tony, um, just do it uh, 8v8 and just drop them in. Actually, I have an idea what I'm going to do. I think I figured it out. But can we do a movie battle royale? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, battle royales are hot right now, dude. Yeah, it's true. I think we can think out of this. Let's have one character from each movie. <laughs> I think Elephant Man would be a favorite, though. I gotta say. Yeah. Just off the bat, he's like the really the. I mean, Wild Child. That guy was kind of messing some people up too. Um, dude, can you imagine if those two got seated against each other? That would truly oh, be man. the like. That would have been the craziest coincidence, yeah. I don't want to when, see the elephant man win. fight, though. That'd break my heart. Yeah, same. No, it would actually win, though. Hmm. It would be um, the homie from the Purple Rose of Cairo. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Literal plot armor. So yeah. I don't think that guy's losing. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. Uh, yeah, and also, though, I would love to see... You know what I'd like to see? That. I'd like to see... Um, What's the name of the kid from Great Expectations? Oh, Pip? Not oh, Pip. Oh, no, 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 Alex. The one who, like, does the exaggerated moves. Not, I think it's not Alex, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, his homie. Yeah. Pip's homie, who uh, is, like, really bad at fighting. <laughs> Pip <laughs> him up. He's like, another one! Come on! Let's <laughs> <laughs> see him versus the wild child. Yeah. Out. Anyways. Um, speaking of the Elephant Man and not wanting to fight, do you guys want to talk about that movie first, or two things I know about her first? Let's talk about Elephant Man first. 
What do we think of Elephant Man? That was a clean movie. Wouldn't you guys agree? I yeah. cried a lot. Yeah. Did you really? Wow. Yeah. That was that would okay. <laughs> I was gonna bring this up, but I think these two are like very opposed in that the story was very strong in Elephant Man, yeah. where there's like no story in two or three things. <laughs> this literally is not a story. Yeah, so it's it's kind of interesting that these two are against each other because like the story was just so powerful in Elephant Man. It's really hard to compare the two. <laughs> yeah, it actually really is. But yeah, I like I had to say, I, I guess for some reason like. It's very difficult for me to get like physically emotional and like choked up when I watch movies, but this Elephant Man, I got pretty dang close to shedding a tear. Well, they have like really three scenes in a row that just like messes you up. Like when he's talking to the wife, and then he's talking to like, the famous lady. Oh my god! And all, oh, before those two is the one where he's talking to the guy. He's like and he's reading the Bible and stuff. It's like scene after scene. And I'm just like, gosh, dang it, dude! This is just like raw human emotion. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to think of what scene it was that was like so powerful. But was it the one on the train station? That one was really good too. That was good. Yeah. Really quick though, I should summarize this movie. Elephant Man is about um, it's based on a true story about oh my gosh, I should actually you know know the Elephant Man's name and not Joseph just Merrick. Joseph John Merrick. No, John oh, Merrick is his fake uh, fake name that everyone miss uh, like is his misnomer basically. His actual oh, okay. name is Joseph Carey Merrick. Well, Joseph Merrick. Interesting. I didn't pick up on that. But I oh. guess we can call him John because throughout the entire movie, that's what he's called. That's basically his name in the movie. Yeah. yeah. Either way, it's fine. Um, John slash Joseph Merrick is this, you know, I guess he was a, was a circus show act, basically, for this one guy. Um, and he gets found by this doctor. The doctor basically kind of tricks the guy into letting him, basically taking him, Taking John away from um, the circus guy whose name is well, Bite, I think, right? Mr. Shreves. Bite. And yeah, and the circus guy's name is Bites. Um, and basically, it seems like it's going to kind of go the way of the wild child where it's like, you know, Mr. Treves is going to teach, um, you know, John Merrick about, like, you know, modern society and everything. But instead, it's like this very different turn where it turns out he actually, like, pretty much knows how to behave and it's more about like overcoming his social anxieties and stuff mm-hmm. and there's also this well i don't want to say side plot because it's like pretty key to the main plot but another plot where um this guy jim he's basically he works as like a night guard for the hospital and he's like letting people into um john merrick's room and because of this bites basically uses this opportunity to take the elephant man away when no one's looking after Jim lets all these people in. And um, so then, but then, the, um, I should say, John Merrick is able to escape and he goes back to um, Treves and they all live happily ever after. That's a pretty useful, you call that side plot, but not really, where, cause like, when all this good stuff is happening, that kind of, like, provides the source of tension because, like, you know, it's like a Chekhov's gun thing. Like, you know something bad's going to happen with that yeah, eventually. Yeah, exactly. So even though it doesn't, like, affect the plot for a really long time, it's, like, kind of keeps, like, turning back to this, like, ticking time bomb. But I have to say, I'm really glad this movie, like, ended on a more or less, like, yes. happy note. Like, I'm yes. so glad he escaped <laughs> and got back. Like, that would have been, like, some Knights of Kiberia, like, breaking my heart type shit. I don't know if him dying that uh is necessarily a a happy note though i think it's pretty much like the happiest we can ask for yeah especially like it's even like i mean you can look at it from like a distance and say like what kind of ending you think it is but in the context of the movie it's definitely set up as like a happy ending yeah definitely because like he finally like lays down like uh and actually gets to rest like a normal human being, and it's very like symbolic of like him finally like reclaiming his humanity on one level, and on another level, it's also like you know his one great big restful sleep of death. Yeah, but it definitely ends like at least he gets back. You know what I mean? The trees and everything, even if yeah. he, um doesn't go. So, you know, he dies. After. I do think, yeah, it's not supposed to be like this really depressing death. It's supposed to be almost like we're saying happy. 
yeah like maybe not like happy but definitely like at least like satisfactory or like content yeah is the word i guess i'm thinking of what do you guys think about this movie being in black and white yes i was actually it's a great question i was also going to ask um i think it really works right? it gives you that kind of like more old-timey feel i i do think it almost cheapens it a bit like this it doesn't feel as much like a modern movie which was my only concern being in black and white where i do think like being brought up are still like very real issues you know mm -hmm. uh, something about like how as aesthetic i think really worked yeah i i think i don't know it feels very effective because it i don't know it especially at the beginning when he's like first introduced it reminds me uh a lot of like old frankenstein movie uh yes exactly mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. like i think it's almost in, i'm pretty sure it's intentionally done on his part the director's part but it's very like frankenstein-esque how it's like he <laughs> he's and i guess his like arc is kind of like frankenstein it's like he's revealed to be like more way more intelligent than he uh he's like assumed to be and whatnot and this kind of like i don't know uh he's the created monster of uh mr bites and whatnot so it's pretty interesting i uh thought that too that the beginning almost feels like a horror movie the way it like really keeps on the edge of your seat it has like this very like you said like gothic monster frankenstein nosferatu kind of vibe which i think is very much complemented by the black and white um and then also the way they like present him as monstrous in the beginning or maybe not quite that far but the way that they reveal him definitely adds to the suspense and adds to the sense of horror that you kind of feel upon seeing him because like when they first show him they'll only show you like brief glimpses which is almost like um kind of like a horror movie principle you know like you never want to show the monster in its entirety just sh like brief glimpses and so that same principle is used here in the beginning to kind of like build tension make him more mysterious and like uh monstrous but then like of course by the end of the movie we're getting full frontal shots in full light so he's it it basically uses like the lighting and how they present him in the shot to like add or take away to his monstrousness yeah, it kind of reflects on how we're supposed to see him at first. Yep. You know I mean? And then That's also, kind of the uh, the music and the sound at the uh, oh, when he's introduced so is so intense, especially in the beginning with the scene where it's like that woman with the elephants just like screaming, or like I guess not screaming, but the m sound, like the music makes it seem like screams. And then like mm -hmm. when the it's kind of like the introduction of that noise that uh, whenever. Elephant Man's like brought up or like talked about, or Trees is going through like the maze or whatever of the circus, and it's like playing. Oh my god, it's so like spooky and intense. Yeah, and like even with um, even that opening credits music is like this really creepy. It's like standard circus music, but it's like as much creepier spin to it. It's like way more like um minor notes and stuff it's really strong one like thing um kind of like off of what you said about it feeling like not like a modern movie i would say to like kind of contrast that is that um although it was in black and white there was some like quality to it that i couldn't quite pin down that made it feel like very like crisp like it was high contrast between the brights and the darks which made it even though like it was black and white it didn't feel that old you know yeah sure. like it was it was so clean like it doesn't look like an old movie i can see that also there's intentional film grain all throughout the film which is interesting and he like ramps it up in like the dream sequence uh sequences like there's like two of them the one at the beginning and then like where the w woman's like thrashing and then there's like uh when Oh, the elephant man john merrick has like the nightmare and it's like the noise that we hear heard before that was like super spooky when he was first introduced is playing and but it's like ramped up and like the, it's all grainy and dreamy pretty cool and it feels like a nightmare mm -hmm. yeah what did you guys think about those like um like the beginning and end sequence of like his dream slash nightmare of his mother or whatever that kind of beginning the beginning and the end of the movie um 
because I was trying to think of like the significance of that necessarily, and like obviously he like loves his mother, and it's sort of like his mother getting like trampled by the elephant is sort of like seen to be like you know the cause of his malformity, but I kind of wondered like what about that was so significant that Lynch chose to have it bookend our movie. I don't think it was so much like his mother uh like him that's like the where his deformity comes from. I think it was supposed to be so much like he's the elephant man, so it's like him like, I don't know, ruining his mother. Kind well, of Well that's like... what they thought back in the day. Like back when they like at this time they thought like he would have thought that Oh yeah. His mother getting stomped would that's what caused it. Like so obviously that's not what it is, but that's what they thought. I did not know that. Um, but in terms of like why we bookend it, I mean, so let's go with that theory almost. We're like, I mean, what is the mother to him, right? It's the womb, you know? And it is this, I think like at the end, it's more, I'm not sure about the beginning, but at the end, I think, I think it's more like he's finally at rest, like we're saying, you know? Yeah. And like, as you are in utero, where you're in rest, you're in a comforting place, and you're with people that love you. And I, that's why I took it, and then just he's almost like going back inside his mom's, you know, uterus and stuff. Yeah, that makes sense. Back in the womb. But yeah, at the beginning, I'm not as sure. I'm not sure if it's just to like dramatize the end better, um, which I would say definitely does an effective job of doing, or just dramatize the beginning itself better. Yeah, it definitely kind of raises the tension a little bit. It gives it like the dramatic flair. So do we know exactly? And I haven't done any research. So like, I'm out of the loop. And also, I took, I was so like emotionally invested in the movie that I had a very hard time taking notes. I don't know if you guys have had that experience with any of the movies that we've watched. Hmm. But um, do we know like how exactly this happened? I know there was like he's having these dreams of people with like these like elephant, like he basically has head shaped masks on, you know, putting it on him. But I was like, do we know how he became this? No, like how they, he became deformed. Yeah, no. Yeah. There's like it's a literally of, just like a genetic disease. No, even then they don't know because they they propose that it was a genetic disease. They multiple genetic diseases, but it was proven. Uh, both, all of them were wrong, and they basically have no idea. And you guys want to talk where he's having the, the dreams of like the guys with like the metal tin like shaped like his head. They think it's Proteus disease, but they don't, uh, or Proteus syndrome, but they don't actually know. But uh, the I don't know what the that means though, because I don't know if it's. I think it's supposed to be like like uh, Caleb said from like the perspective of this time, so maybe it's literal. Hmm. Yeah, I was just like a bit confused about that. So yeah. I took it more like meta like. I I felt like uh, it was like meant like more like figurative. Making him the monster. Yeah, like so society is like making him the monster. They like they're that's like the theme or whatever is that society expects him to be the freak or the monster that he is, but really he's uh just a, a guy. He just a human being, and he's kind of like has. He has the own uh, prejudice on himself that he is a monster, and then he has. And his arc is coming to terms with the fact that he's actually a human being. He just, yeah, exactly. And like it's his own assertion that he is right, because like in the beginning when he goes to um, the doctors and like people are trying to talk to him and he like can't even manage to do that until. That's kind of like contrasted with the very end when he's being like chased through the train station and he, you know, has that great like, I am not an animal, I am a man. And that's like him, like, I guess you could tell like standing up for himself or like asserting his own humanity, you know? Mm -hmm. But it sucks that that take out of him for him to do that. You know what I mean? Yeah. He ends up, you know, fainting after that. And. Uh, it's like not any sort of comic vein. It's like very heavy, and we tell that took everything, you know, for him to stand up for himself and come to terms with that. I think it makes the whole movie all more powerful. Yeah. One thing that I also think is super cool about this movie is how it 
makes you really reflect on yourself. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I, for one, maybe you guys are better people than me. I had a hard time watching this movie at first, you know? Not just from emotional perspective, but just like literally looking at him, you know? Oh, yeah. Difficult. Um, it makes me a bad person. Yeah, and I think it also, like, that's probably intentional a little bit because um, Treves has that line where he says, you know, like, am I a good man or am I a bad man? So I think that's, like, definitely one of the major themes of this movie is, uh, you know, sort of questioning that. So I think it's probably intentional that he made you think that. Yeah, I don't know. I think that's uh, uh, part of it, uh, or the problem is that it's kind of, he knows that he has to wear the mask, and that's, like, the only way he can, like, get around. But even then, there's, like, the monstrous music playing, which is, like, I guess the, like, aura or the atmosphere that he has inherently. Mm-hmm. Well, he's also have to, supposed to have, like, a really bad smell, too. Yeah, it is that. But then, I think it's cool how, as we see different people interact with him, particularly um, the wife and the actress how we are able to like almost interact with the viewer more easily. At least I was when you see like the wife, like make this very concerted effort to keep eye contact with him. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it made me realize like, man, like it's actually really messed up that people don't do this. And like, he literally breaks down crying basically just from her looking at him. Yeah. You know? I think she, like, it was like a handshake or something, right? Like yeah. she like, like, touches him and he's like, Oh my God. Oof. And then also that scene where they're, uh, the actress is like doing the play and she kisses him on the cheek. Like, holy crap. That's like, I don't know, that's oh, heavy. It's so good. It's so good. It's, there's, there's three scenes. In, what's what I'm looking for? It's a question of the religious scene of him reading the Bible and then the scene of the wife and the scene with the actress are all so great and all do different things too. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh my gosh. And that religious scene, like this movie, it's crazy how it's both like, it's obviously very strong social commentary that makes you reflect on yourself and you know also just, like social anxieties and stuff and like how we treat people. But then also it has these religious themes and these themes on and like its purpose in relation to people. Like really makes you think that too, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I don't care. You know, I grew up in a religious family. Maybe this is like me being a sucker, but like, I really think for almost everybody, it's hard to watch that scene of him, you know, reading the Bible and just like the expression on his face and not think that like, at least somewhat, you know, he like, not at least like not understand why like religion is so important for people, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I agree. That's kind of like when he's reciting that passage, that's like his first assertion of like humanity and the first assertion to like establish his own humanity to like let him get to stay in the hospital, right? Like it's this like commonality between himself and everyone else. So like he's read the same Bible verse, he he knows it. And I think it's interesting that you point out like the social commentary aspect of this because this movie is like almost kind of like a feel-good movie and then it's a it's a social commentary, but um, it does so not by, like, critiquing society only, but also by, like, providing a good example. Because, like, when this woman, like, this beautiful actress, like, kisses him on the cheek and, you know, the wife, like, gives him a handshake, it's like, I don't know, to some degree, like, like, it is possible to, like, be a kind person, and this kindness, like, does make a difference. So it's not, like... A social commentary that just shows how bad society is it does do that to some extent but it also like provides a good example of like something we can strive for and shows us the good that it can do yeah exactly and that's what i was talking about like the whole self-reflection as it goes on like i think just it shows you like how much not even because i think so often we want to be genuinely kind you know what i mean mm-hmm. but just how even like you know and that's why um Oh my gosh, I keep forgetting his name. Uh, snap. Um, Treves. I can't. I want to say Reeves and like thieves, but <laughs> Treves. 
I mean, he has this moment where he's like, am I a bad person? And his wife's like, honey, like, you're ridiculous. Like, he is happy. Who cares about your, your own morality when it comes to this? Mm-hmm. And showing, like, sometimes we get so involved in, like, what is, you know, inherently good and inherently bad, you know, inherently you know, morally upright or whatever. We like, forget what the actual point of all that is, which is to make other people happy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think, like, a lesser movie would have, and, like, a much more boring movie of this would have taken the approach of, like, because there is a little bit in there about how, like, even, uh, like, in this new life, um, he's still a little bit of, like, an exhibition. You know, like, when he goes to the play and everybody, like, you know, she's, like, thanks him and so everybody turns and looks at him and then, you know, people, all these high society members are visiting him and treating him with kindness, but it's also just because they want to kind of see the exhibition. So, like, there's a little bit of that in there. But I think a lesser movie would make the would kind of be making the claim of like, look, see, like is no better. This is just as bad. Whereas like this movie, like while it has that, is it does a good job of showing us like his life is still immeasurably better than it was before. And even if like these high society people like aren't maybe like perfect because they still kind of want to go see the exhibition, they're at least treating him with kindness, and that does make a difference. One thing I didn't love is, like, how this comments on class in, like, this very uncomfortable way where there's almost no one who is lower class who is, like, kind to him. That's true. And I thought that was a bit bizarre to me. I didn't know if that was intentional or, though, or I think intentional in that way. I don't think it was so much. I think it was the people who are, like, lower class don't have, like, the, uh, like, allowance to be nice to him i suppose they're also they're also kind of like in a similar and not maybe not the exact same but they're not exactly the well-off in this situation they're also kind of the downtrodden in this society yeah also that's not necessarily true because the uh the other circus performers help him escape and show him kindness at the end that is very end. true but then that's like a whole different thing right where there are also people who are like you know, gawked at and stared at. Yeah, and also... Yeah, but they're still, like, on the low end of society. They have, don't have any social status, then they're being kind to him. So I, I see what you're saying, and I agree that, that that's in there, but I think as to slightly undercut that, there is one example of a... And there's plenty of people kind. who were, like, the well-off who are not nice to him. It's just, like, in this society, it's probably not that expected for these people to be nice to the elephant man, who they just consider a freak. Yeah, maybe it's, like, less an indictment on class, or maybe it's more, like, a stress of the importance of education, right? Like, um, like social education, like, how it is really important to, like, you know, teach each other to love each other and stuff like that. Yeah. You know? like, it's important to know what is okay, because sometimes it's not inherent to us. Mm-hmm. Let's see. We haven't talked oh, about yeah, the acting the... yet, though. Oh, the acting. Okay, talk about the acting, Derek. Uh, well, Anthony H- Hopkins. Okay, yeah. Because it, to kind of fit in the theme of what we're saying. Uh, but I think the whole thing about uh, why he loves the theater so much and why theater is such a big deal in this movie is because of, uh, like, that's the one situation where, like, he is not the spectacle, you know? Yeah. Like, he gets to go to this theater and everyone's eyes are off him. Which is obviously kind of, like, perverted at the very end when everyone turns to him and starts clapping because the, you know, the star of the show, like, thanks Mm -hmm. him personally. Um, So it definitely is, like, a little bit of an ironic kind of twist there that's not... doesn't make you feel great. But uh, at the very least, I think that's, like, an important reason why he likes the theater. Anyway, now we can talk about all the acting and non-narrative stuff. Anthony Hopkins nailed this role really well. And obviously John Hurt did an amazing job as John Merrick. Definitely not easy doing this through prosthetic and actually uh, ask, projecting you know emotion. He did it? Like how exactly what well, they did to him? Is? Well, he got, they had a prosthetic over his face and like over his body and stuff. So definitely not uh, very easy to act through that. I see. 
That is impressive. I didn't even think about that. That would have been, like, very taxing. Especially because, like, it's not like they're constantly cutting away from his face or anything, right? Like, they make you... <laughs> yeah. See his emotions. Oh, my gosh. That scene where he first meets the guy, and he's just so nervous. I think that's when I started crying. I actually didn't stop. When he first meets um the guys on the board, um, car uh, going. Yeah. That and was so great. Dude, He's just it's so good. You can really just feel John Hurt's emotions. Would you guys stand on um Wendy Hiller's character Mrs. Mother's head? The Wait, head... is she the like the nurse or whatever, like yeah. doctor? No, she was good. Like as a character or as an actress? As a character, yeah. She was good. She kinda has like her little redemption and moment of like standing up to uh uh with the treves and like kind of trying to stop the you know little parade that he's been putting on so i think that's like really good it shows like a character transition which is pretty cool to see in a character that's like you know tertiary like to actually yeah have development in a tertiary character is like pretty and, cool in an efficient way that actually doesn't take away from the story Yes, exactly. It's like, dude, this movie is so clean. Like, everything is done, like, really well. Yeah, and it... Because it takes... I mean, it, you know, continues her character, or develops her character, while also continuing um, Treves' character development, right? I think that's what you know you mean by efficient character. Yes. Uh, yeah, it not only is, like, a very short scene, but also just... It actually adds to the story. Which just makes it... A lesser movie would have cut away to, uh, away from like the main narrative to do that, and would have wasted time on it, when they could have uh more effectively just combined the main narrative with this development. But, uh, David Lynch basically just kind of like bulldoze through it. Not bulldoze, <laughs> but like managed to just like yeah, build the rail <laughs> uh, railway through these two things and bring them together. And with a character we know, right? It's not like some random person who's just being introduced. Yeah. I just had a hard time. Did it hit him? You know what I mean? And maybe that is part of the class thing, right? Maybe that is, you know, my counterpoint to my earlier point. Maybe that helps add to um, it's less about, you know, the lower class. It's more about, you know, just kind of education and like understanding these people who are, you know, disabled and stuff. Because. She ends up understanding him more, and she ends up treating him better, you know, and not like a child or like an animal. And then Am Anthony Hopkins, I, uh, was such a good like backboard for John Hurt. It was kind of like if even if like John Hurt, like maybe like one or two times, like the emotion wasn't like there because he has to like act through a prosthetic so it's only really the voice that we get in like i don't know maybe like we don't really get the happiness we can just see it in like anthony hopkins eyes what as a viewer we should be receiving uh, from john hurt it's really interesting i didn't think about it, like that aspect of his performance and then, Anthony, especially in uh, the scene that I was thinking of when I first, uh, when I, when Anthony Hopkins meets uh, or sees Elephant Man for the first time, we don't see Elephant Man at that time, but we see Anthony Hopkins see Elephant Man, and he just, just like the, like what Anthony Hopkins sees is just so incredible that he begins to like cry, but not like in like a serious way, but like in an astonishment way, and just mm -hmm. like. So perfect. What'd you guys think of our two villains in this movie? Um, Bites and Jim. I thought uh, Bites in particular, like, talking about performance, I think he was a really good actor. Like, Hated he, him. Yeah, he, I don't know, like, he portrays this, like, uh, kind of, like, subdued evil, I guess you could say, where it's almost like a lurking... Yeah like, sinister aspect, rather than, like... Like a Mr. Over Potter kind-esque, yeah. He doesn't, over, he doesn't overact it, you know what I mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
He pulls off, and also he's also on top of that pretty skeevy of a guy without that being over the top as well. Yeah. Like, you know, we understand each other. Like, ugh. You want to wash your hands. Like, <laughs> but yeah, like, I think, like, it was grounded enough that, like, I could definitely see this guy existing and, like, see the conditions that led to this guy. So it was, it wasn't, like, overly, like, high concept, I guess you could say. It was, how, like, walk me through all the emotions as we were going through the scene where Jim lets all the people in and bites, well, first we don't even realize bites is going to come along, and then bites is like, hey, how much for one more? And he's, you know, gives him the yeah. money. And then, well, first we deal with Jim abusing John and, like, the most hurtful way, you know, throwing him around, making him kiss those girls. Oh my god! Pouring was that alcohol on him? Yeah. All of that was just awful. And then, and like to the point where I had forgot about bites, you know. And then bites comes back in, like oh my gosh. Yeah, this is. I was like, oh my god, you're serious? This is happening. It's it's oh. like the fucking like devil coming out of the fucking shadows, or like yeah. the Grim Reaper coming to take your soul. Speaking of like performance, the way that uh like John Hurt does like acts in that scene is so effective because he's like he almost like doesn't do anything. He's like catatonic. He just like it's almost like he's uh you know like blanking out. Like he's not even there. Like. While this stuff is happening, he basically just becomes like a rag doll, and like, because he can't do anything about it. And he's so afraid and, of the situation. Yeah. And man, like the the coolest touch though on that scene was at the end when like Jim like kind of claps him on the shoulder and like gives him some money and like almost has this like moment of camaraderie and like ah go thanks for being a good sport all that kind of stuff. Yeah, and he, he doesn't totally... even realize. Yeah, like, he totally has this rationalized in his head that, like, you know, the elephant man's, like, his buddy to some degree, and, uh, you know, he's bringing up all these girls to go party with him, you know? Which is obviously not the case, but that's, like, at least how he's rationalized it. I guess to, you know, shift responsibility off of himself or something. But then, and Jim's such a great foil with two bites, I think. You know? Yeah, mm-hmm. Where Jim's just this very loud, and like you said, he's, they really wants to, ra- they both rationalize it, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Those two were like, he, because he doesn't see John as human, he's able to just be like, you know, he was mine first, I found him, and he almost doesn't even trust the doctor. And you understand, like, where he's coming from, because it does, from an outside perspective, you know, all these newspaper articles coming out about all these celebrities coming to see him. Mm-hmm. So the doctor, you know, is making more of a racket off of. Um, exactly. Yeah, he's just as bad. Yeah, exactly. Well, and he's not actually making money off of it. You know, oh, no, I mean, like, no, like, he's not as bad. But I'm saying from yeah. Bites's mind, he's just as bad. So it's really easy to, you know, he's just taking him back. You know, he's not taking him away from anything. Mm-hmm. But once again, that just makes it. All the worse, I think. Yeah. And you really understand both the rationale, but then Jim is just so... He's just like peak hooligan. He's like... Yeah, exactly. He's not... I mean, he is slimy, but it's just not in the same way. You know? Uh, Even yeah, when like... he gets confronted, he's like... Just so out of loop on anything, right? Mm-hmm. Really, like... The situation like, almost means nothing to him, except for like a money opportunity while like with bites it is so much more personal yeah that's true they're so good like to have and that's really such a cool like storytelling technique to have two villains that are each like different like grades of villain like one is much more evil than the other one and they just kind of like kind of play off each other in a pretty interesting way well uh any more comments about this movie are we ready to move on to a movie that both lend itself to discussion more easily and also significantly more difficult. <laughs> yeah, I think I've said pretty much everything on this movie. There's okay. interesting uh, technique 
in the dreams, like in like I guess the beginning technically where uh he overlaps images and like one in the foreground and the background. Uh, a lot of superimposition. Yeah, it it's it's it, it's interesting how he does that and why he does that. It's it's very Wait, are we talking about two or three things now? No, we're talking about Elephant Man still. Okay, uh, okay. It's I don't uh it's very spooky how when he does it. I don't know. It it really kind of creeped me out. It was something about it that was just like off-putting when he did it. I could see that. And I don't know. It was really effective. Uh, I, I could definitely feel it being dreamy and like nightmarish. I think it, that worked really well too. And also, like, I think it gives you more, the only dreams are of um, are John's, right? And it really gives you like into how his mind works, right? Where all these things are happening, and like, although he understands most of it, he can't quite separate things yet. Mm -hmm. Which I think also really works. Yeah. Now can we talk about two three things? Is that okay? Mm-hmm. Yeah, let's talk about two three things I know about her. Which I took a lot of notes for this movie. I don't know about you guys. I did. I took quite a few pages. Damn, that's wow. a lot. It's a lot of notes. Am I right? That's a and lot of notes. I have three pages, and I've looked over these notes. I've really tried to think of what great this movie, and I still have no idea what even like happened in this movie. Let alone like what i'm supposed to take away from it i honestly don't know if you're supposed to take away anything away from this movie yeah <laughs> i i don't think that was so much the point i think this was like an essay uh uh godard wanted to do about things that he wanted to talk about in uh like this is like a snapshot of this woman's life and what this is like i think supposed to be like the average contemporary life of this time Mm -hmm. So this kind of like just a 24-hour snapshot of all that, including random things that Godard wants to talk about in kind of his uh, fourth wall uh, voiceover uh, discussions. Yeah, it's pretty much like a philosophical video essay, pretty much. Just gets to yeah. riff on stuff for a while. And it's interesting because this is not our first video essay that we've watched, right? We also watched F is for Fake. Or F for fake, rather. Oh, huh? yeah, true. But it is... I think there were also elements of it in the sacrifice. Yes, but... In I'm... a narrative way, this is that. more of a yeah. very well, direct... Well, no, because in, uh, in the sacrifice, the guy like literally like has this like protracted philosophical discussion. Yeah, but that's the this guy time. within the story, so we're... it's like him... Oh, yeah, I see. So... Yeah, it's definitely not to the quite the same thing. But... I, I get what you're meaning, though. Yeah. Yeah, I do see what you're saying. I think the sacrifice almost feels more like one note, you know, like this level of Stuart, right? Where there is just like a bunch of like philosophical discussions, but maybe nothing quite as blatant, you know, yeah. and you no know, like talking to the camera or anything. Mm -hmm. A lot of talking to the camera. And it's just bizarre because like, we don't even know what's going on at first, right? So I didn't realize. <laughs> so we have this character. Juliet Jansen, played by something Vladdy. Is it Mar Marina. Marina Vladdy. We know that that's who it's played by. But because he literally tells us this is a character being played by this actress, right? Yeah. <laughs> Which was like already just like, what? <laughs> You're not supposed to do that, you know? Mm hmm. Um, Godard gives no fucks. Yeah, exactly. It just, oh, it just reads so different. And it's like so frustrating, but also like so compelling. And basically, it just goes through her life, basically. Um, but also, there's all these like indictments on capitalism mm -hmm. all at the same time that like almost being like brainwashed into us, right? It really does feel like a brainwashing. You guys think that's fair to say? Like, yeah, it, it's with those. Stuff. It's the weird whispering, honestly, and then like the disassociative like looks at the cameras that the characters do. Yes. Hmm. Like, and it gets quieter and quieter too. Like, oh my god, don't even. Really, oh my gosh. When, especially when he. Okay, I know it's. There's like two times when it gets like super quiet is when he focuses on the 
a cup of coffee and like on the cigarette butt that's just getting oh my lit. God. Those so Dude, close those two scenes were so goddamn good. Yeah, those close-ups were orgasmic, but it gets so fucking quiet and it just like in your head is like Oh my god. Yeah, I think that was my favorite scene when he's like doing that monologue and it's like the coffee bubbles kind of just like spinning around and that that was like so cool. It was like a solid like 2 minutes of this like cup of like close up of the bubbles in the cup of coffee and, and like you're yeah. compelled to look at it you know yeah it's like really like a great shot it's like beautiful but so and the reason i said this is like both easy to talk about and harder is because like obviously there's no offense to lynch there's a lot more going on through there's a lot more choices being made right Where, yeah as um elephant man kind of flows with what it is you know and yeah literally, because this is literally an essay once in a while but yeah, this is like literally. Like, it seems like every like every sentence is like a choice that um that Godard is making, and it's so. But then, how do we want to go through this chronologically or what? I think chronologically is almost the only like feasible way to go through it. Maybe no. I feel like you could kind of divide it up into topics. He literally he divides it up like into essay topics, though. <laughs> yeah. yeah, like there's almost like three or four different things that he kind of like keeps coming back to so we could also do it that way and that might be easier because i don't remember any narrative or chronology of this movie whatsoever there's no narrative well, the, the idea of narrative topic. is so oh, oh my god the first topic is 18 les cons sur la société industrielle so um <laughs> which is a book apparently fun fact and then that's Kind of gets us into basically language and industrial society and whatnot. Yeah, that's if there's one point of this movie, it's that the industrial revolution and its consequences have been a disaster for the human race. This guy is basically all about modernity is oppressive and invasive and is like really bad. At least that's what this movie's claiming. Wouldn't you guys agree? Yeah. I think yes. what he's he's equating this to is also like he his character is a prostitute literally because he thinks people are prost or like prostituting their like time and mind on a daily basis. Oh, I like that dude. And there was also it's kind of a subtle thing, but uh, when that like uh, woman was in the bath and like the utility company like just kind of like comes in. Oh yeah. I mean, it's like, what are you doing? And he's like, I'm checking the meter. <laughs> it's like, uh, <laughs> that's pretty funny. But also, it's like, um, kind of like the invasiveness of this, like, you know, the edifice of society or whatever. Mm -hmm. But also, just like the lack of caring, right? Like, not like an apathy, but just like a how far from human humanity, I guess. That, like, it doesn't matter that she's naked and yeah, freaked out. But like, I think ever comes of that, you know. Yeah. Like, yeah, like, he doesn't even react. He's not like, oh, sorry. He's just like, I'm checking the mirror. It's what I do. <laughs> what do you want? <laughs> Let's see. I'm trying yeah. to, like, pick out first all the things. a lot of quotes about cities. Yeah. Uh, you know, obviously, we should accept our favorite quote for the end, but I think it'd be kind of foolish not to be talking about quotes throughout this movie, because, like, it's such a dialogue-heavy movie. Mm -hmm. I think the quotes inform our view of the movie in this very real way. So any the quotes from this first part that really stood out to you? I I don't know if it was quite like the first chapter or whatever you want to call it, but it was um, you can describe everything I do without describing why I do what I do, which is like, that's mm -hmm. kind of like, there's like maybe like four or five topics. One of them is, one of them is industrialization, which is closely related to the war. And then there's like language. And this like, sort of describes like the short fallings of language and that like you could say a lot of words about something without actually like like understanding it i guess is maybe the way you could describe it that's from the end though isn't it isn't that like when the coffee shop time oh it's it's the whole thing like it definitely like because that came up like at least in the first like third or quarter of the movie okay interesting yeah, so like that's what I'm saying is like it's kind of tough to like divide yeah, this yeah, movie yeah, up yeah, chronologically yeah. because you like, can use just you can describe anything with logic without using emotion. Technically, it's the second chapter of the movie or whatever, but yes. Yeah, I thought it was on the first or second, but. And then it cuts right to an industrial shop. 
<laughs> yeah. No, it, it really does, like, kind of just, like, pan back and forth between all these things. But would you, what would you guys say, like, are the other major topics? Because we have war, industrialization slash modern society, language. Consumerism. Yeah, I feel like that's kind of, like, bundled in with modern society, though. Yeah. Um, I guess, like, well, there's this whole thing with the novel, though, that kind of goes into this language. Um, one of the, oh, the form. The form's definitely a big thing. Wait, 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 the form? Yeah, like, shape. Okay, yeah. Um, and, like, you know, you have, like, the whole thing about, like, the full face and the profile and stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, I think that also definitely bundles in, yeah, with, yeah, it's Also, I know that this is, like, kind of a addition thing, but also not, just, like, it's, yeah, it makes a lot of specific comments on America itself. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um. Okay, so that's something that I kind of want to bring up, because it kind of might color, like, especially a lot of this war stuff. It's a little bit of historical context. Uh, the war in Vietnam... Like, we went to war there because of France, basically, because yeah. it was a French colony. And then they were rebelling against France. And then we were like, okay, back up, France. We got this one for you. Um, so I kind of wonder, like, I don't really know that many details beyond that. But I would imagine that that's a large part of why the Vietnam War is so important to the French people. And I'm sure it has some effect on, like, how they view it. Like, if maybe... And this is maybe might be reaching, but I wonder like if they feel some degree of responsibility or something along those lines. I don't know. And then also like definitely there's like some feminist themes in here. And I would say that there's also just like um some kind of existential themes in here as well. Yeah, certainly. Like unhappiness. And then yeah, so definitely feminist themes as well. Speaking mm-hmm. that like are all of those characters in the in that hairdresser scene? But I'm looking get through my notes. I don't know. It's it was tough to tell. Like and they're all giving their backstories. It's like makes you kind of think they must be, but then wow. this is a pretty cool style of film because it's like you get to basically like read a philosophical essay while also looking at beautiful shots of gorgeous women the whole time. So yeah, it was really, really good. Great. It gets you on like a lot of levels. <laughs> well, both these films, I think, are. The decision to take notes or to not take notes, I think, really affects your viewing of the film. You know what I mean? Yeah. I oh. Because I was, like, so intent on, like, the language, and, like, I paused every once in a while, just, like, write down a quote and stuff. I almost forget it affected my viewing of the film for the worst, because I was like, almost thinking about it on too high concept of a level. Oh, yeah. So, which thing do you want to talk about first? I guess... I. Th- Let's talk about the industrialization and, like, society, because I feel like sure. that's an easy one to tie into. And it, prevailing and, the whole movie, too. Yeah, and it also, like, ties in a lot to the shots, because they'll intersperse all these shots uh, with shots of, like, you know, the city and all these high-rise buildings and construction and what modernization. Caleb. What did you say? You're, you cut out just a little bit. What do you think they say about society? These shots? Which film? It's oppressive, like it's, I said. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's like oppressive and invasive, and it's like harming our natural way of being, probably. Let's see if I look through my notes and if I can sum anything up. Why all these shots of like these like construction sites and whatnot, or these buildings and stuff? Well, because like, they're living in a city, and so it's A, it kind of establishes the space, and B, it's sort of like every time you see them, it kind of just looks like a tangled mess of you know, concrete and metal, and at yeah. least that was the vibe I got. Like, it, they're not, like, necessarily, like, favorable scenes. Um, let's see. I'm trying to I'm just look through my notes really quick. And also, I think it gives us a level of confusion that we would never feel if we were seeing these things, you know, on a daily basis, right? Mm-hmm. So they, we from these in the movie, we're like, what's the purpose, you know? Why <laughs> are these here? You see, but the thing is, it's just things that we see in daily life, right? Whenever, yeah. Like, why are these buildings here? What is their purpose, et cetera? So mm-hmm. it makes you almost consider more like, what are these buildings and what's happening around us that we have literally no control over and no idea about? Yeah. You know, of kind of secret institutions and whatnot. Also, 
I don't know um, what necessarily caused me to write this, but towards the end of the movie, I wrote, society is exhausted. And I think that's like, it's, as a society, we are like exhausted with ourselves and like society itself is an exhausting endeavor. Like it's very tiring to have to like keep up with all of this and it's so unnatural and like sucks so much out of you. And I think that was like definitely a very big like feeling at the end when they're kind of like going to sleep is that like all of this has been so draining, you know? Yeah, I could see that. But like back, sorry, back to the city they really do think like it's important that we kind of, you know what I mean, really ex- specifically explore like all this imagery because it comes up so often. Um, I have a quote here that I want to hear you guys' opinions on where it was a couple quotes. He's talking about cities towards the end of the first chapter. He's saying some of the past semantic richness will be lost. And he says the city's creative and formative role will be taken over by other systems of communication, maybe television, radio. Um, I don't think, oh, uh, vocabulary and syntax knowingly and intentionally. We say, yeah, and then right after that, that's when you say, like, or maybe you won't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was pretty funny. But yeah, I thought this, this movie was, like, super prescient of, like, future technological innovations, because I feel like everything he's saying is, like, still on the money. Yeah, it really is. It just, you know, internet, too, now. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's like, that's like the next level, but like he definitely saw the trend coming. But so he's almost, while I feel like he's presenting the city as almost a dangerous space, he's also kind of lamenting the downfall of the city, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. As society kind of becomes more individualistic. Maybe. And he is, that's like what it is. He's saying, you know, the city's creative and formative role will be taken over by the other systems. I think it's a lamentation. Okay, well, maybe it almost seems like we're maybe talking about two different things because you might be, maybe he's referring to city, and it kind of gets a little hairy because I can definitely see how like subtle differences in translations could really change like the semantic yeah. thing that we're saying. But he could be ma- meaning city in terms of like the culture or the society, you know, like the group of people that's kind of like collectively like being taken over by the buildings like the the institutions right like our life like our collective lives are becoming less about the people and more about the institutions that those people make up i guess if that makes sense right yeah i could see that yeah yeah i mean i also do think i think it is almost like a dual purpose on purpose you know where it is also the city as in, like, the, the buildings, you know, and just the outside, you know? So much of this movie takes place indoors, which is, like, you yep. know, which gives you very little relief. You know, you want to go outside when you're watching a movie. You want freedom, right? Yeah. You're seeing all this freedom, and it's, like, freedom that's, like, not taken as the city's kind of both want it. But anyways, um, but yeah, and as it's almost like, the outside is gone, you know? These buildings are being, aren't being made anymore to, like, bring people together, but to keep people in, you know? Yeah. Derek, any thoughts? You've been quiet for a while. None unique to what has already been said. Okay, so do we want to move on from the city? We talk about form, which is the second chapter. Psychology of form is the second Chapter <laughs> weird stuff going on here. This is gonna be hard to talk about. Just Why? A lot of... It's um, I don't know. I feel like he has a lot of ideas, but I should say it's wankery. But it's sort of just like uh, it's he's sort of noodling around a little bit. It seems like you know, he's just kind of kicking around some ideas. You know, like yeah. even. It wasn't in context of this, but that whole thing where I, we mentioned a little bit earlier about how like he kind of goes on the spiel about it's going to be this and then it's going to be this, or maybe it won't. You know, like I don't feel like he's like dead convinced of all the things he's saying. He's kind of just playing with ideas. See, like I see what you're saying, but I, I almost feel like it's hard for me to like make that judgment call. I fair, won't... yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's fair. If rewatch what they would do, I haven't returned the movie yet. I'm debating. 
watching it. I don't know. I think that's fairly accurate, though. At least the impression... Maybe it's intentional to be unintentional on his part. I don't think... This is an essay that he's doing, but it's not... It's for his own sake, at least. And that's kind of like the feel you're getting. Why do you say that? Huh? I think you cut out there for a little bit. So why do you say that? Just because of the style he's using. He's using all these direct cuts, all these in, like, distinct languages. Like, he said, uh, Caleb, what he brought up, where he's like, or it's not. It's or right for it to be or not as well in his mind it is yeah i think i think also like you can't isolate like all of this narrative or like sort of like how would you say like out of the action conversation from like what's actually happening on screen so i think maybe to a certain degree like this is in like a meta way like philosophical discussion as like an object is what he's using to like embellish these scenes so it's not necessarily even like what's being said as much as the fact that like we're having this like intellectual discussion as an aesthetic virtue to complement what's happening on screen if that makes sense do you guys understand what i mean or is that like yeah that makes that made sense I just feel like I just do think there's like a lot going on in this movie, you know? Because there's so much that he's doing, right? Where yes, I mean, I see what you're saying, but like it's more about the image, basically, right? Is that like a good way of like summing up? And like his words complement the image more than the image complements the words. Yes, bingo. That's exactly what I'm trying to say. And that might just be like ignorance on my part because i'm not seeing all the complex ways that the images are complementing the words but i that's my gut feeling upon first viewing and that's like that's what the podcast is over first viewing so that's the best thing i can say for now then like there's these scenes where, like there's a car and it's being really intrusive to what's saying oh gosh i wish i could find it um this is what i'm talking about was this car running while she's trying to talk yeah Oh, annoying. Yeah, he does that multiple times, like, when there's a very loud noise being, like, super annoying to what's going on. Like, he does it, he does that intentionally, like, I think four times, there's, like, a loud, it's, there's a very disconnect, like, big, like, disconnect between his, like, quiet whispering and, like, the highest volume, which is, like, very loud, like, there's the gun that is, like, the kid shoots, then there's the car... Uh, and then there's like the car wash noise that generator like, too. I think at some point. Yeah, like it's just very like harsh. That definitely is that like that's kind of the fits with the theme of you know industrial society being invasive and annoying and all that. Mm -hmm. By the way, one more quote on the whole industrial society being invasive thing. Um, <laughs> there's a quote: "If at chance you can't afford LSD, then buy a color TV." Yeah, I, I wrote that down. <laughs> Which is pretty funny because, especially, like, in the 60s when this movie was made, like, it, like, it's kind of flipped around, right? Because acid would have been, like, maybe, like, a dollar, whereas mm -hmm. I'm sure a TV would have been much more expensive back then. So, like, it almost makes, like, it would have made more sense to say, if you can't afford a TV, buy LSD, right? But he flips it around, which is certainly deliberate. I just don't know exactly why. Because it's it's ironic. Yeah, it's like, it's funny. It's like that's what I mean about like this. I mean, not quite wankery, but he's having fun with this, you know. Yeah, th this he's is being a little silly. He's having fun with his essay. This is. This, mm -hmm. I feel like this is him going out and like giving a speech or whatever isn't isn't to be like. I'm informing my audience. It's I'm right, or maybe I'm not. That's okay, okay too. You, you say things that I almost agree with, Derek, but then like, like I don't think he like claims to be right. Strictly. Yeah, that's the thing. He he claims to be right or wrong. It doesn't matter so much to him. <laughs> he's just saying the things that he thinks. Yeah, he's just like it's almost like he's enjoying the discussion for the sake of it. Yeah. Yeah. Like like that. Like, I guess maybe, that's maybe a better maybe way to revise. It yeah. That's like a way to that's... revise what I said before. It's not about the philosoph philosophical 
answer. It's about the philosophical discussion, and the discussion itself yeah, is like the Rothbard. is the virtue. And he's almost I'm talking about you know, the relation image the word. He's almost discussing with the image, you know. Yeah. Through a conversation going between us, our narrator, um, slash, and then like whatever's actually supposed to be going on in the film, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But then our narrator's kind of melded with the film, right? Because I feel like Juliet is as much a part, like as much part of the narration as she is a part of the film. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And they did a great scene where well, all the characters are literally doing stream of consciousness. Yeah, she literally says, "Yeah, yeah." Which is really cool. I don't know if I've ever seen like true stream of consciousness voiced by the actor in a movie before. Like that might be the first time I've seen that. Pretty cool. Are you talking about the one where they're at the house and I she... don't quite remember. She's like no 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 no. So she's getting her hair done or her fingernails done or something. And then this woman is like having a conversation with her and then she's also having a conversation back. But, like, in between the back and forth of their conversation, the yes, main yes, woman yes. is speaking whatever thought she would have. So, like, a telephone thing, and she'd be like, oh, there's the telephone. Or, like, or like the girl, like, is saying something, and she's like, oh, she's so annoying, or something like that. Like, you, wouldn't you just shut up? And then she'll be like, oh, yeah, and, like, respond. Like, it, there's, like, a conversation plus stream of consciousness. But the stream of consciousness is actually verbally said, which is what I mean. It's, like, I haven't seen before. She does that as well with like her hooker friend when she's uh in like the big hotel yeah, that's what or whatnot. I was thinking of. Yeah, she yeah. she's like uh the it first starts like she's like where's your or bef she's like oh this is a big place and like yada 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 Thought, and then she's like thoughts agree with reality or challenge it to challenge and then all of a sudden like where's your guy yeah <laughs> and then she even says like maybe the observer of the spectacle is me <laughs> she's literally like talking about yeah. And it really gets you confused who's having the discussion, which you think almost makes the movie more compelling. Um, but back to form, which we never actually talked about. I think that is really important. Do you guys have any thoughts on this like theme of like the form or like what is like uh, I guess like almost like the platonic ideal? It's kind of hinted at throughout this movie. Mm. I have no idea. Scenes. And maybe you can talk about also we have the profile scene, right? Where she's um, it's her and she's like having coffee with somebody, and they're both looking at this picture. And one person sees it from one direction, one person sees it from the other direction, and she says something like, "Um, where's the truth in this?" You know. Mm -hmm. But another scene that I think was almost more interesting when it comes to form is the scene between this Nobel Prize winner and this basically like fan of his, like a student of his. You. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That was hilarious. But it ends with this really cool shot of the. I actually angle the camera so that we see perfectly both sides of his profile. Yes, I wrote that down. That was so cool. So you're gonna see both sides of his face at the same time. It's but like from the. But it's not like you know you see like three quarters of his face and you see like the other fourth of his face in the mirror, right? It's literally one half of his face in person, one half in the mirror, exactly, which is super cool. Yeah, that was awesome. And but I think maybe we can talk about that and like it ends with that, which I think is um that moment which is significant. Do you want to talk about this conversation, Derek, which you seem to find pretty interesting? I thought it was hilarious because she's like there's like such implied like tension going on in that scene. Like the the girl is like I don't really have anyone to talk to. It's like what makes you think I'm the guy uh person you need to talk to? And it's like there's that weird tension that, like, this guy <laughs> is almost, like, trying to get in her head. This girl just wants this guy to shut up and, like, listen to her. It's like, she's, like, afraid to say what she, and she's also tra afraid to say what she truly means. It's like, I don't know. I don't know. It was just so funny. It was, there's, like, such, it's the most, like, playful moment in the film for me. It was like, mm -hmm. but also there's like some really insightful, insightful things being said, where he's like talking about um, anything that embellishes life is destructive, right? I really don't remember what that was like in regard to. But... Did you guys notice that he was dressed in uh, black and red, and I think he might be supposed to, yeah, be he... representative of the devil or something. 
Oh, no, I didn't catch that. Yeah, he was. It was like a black coat with like a red undershirt. And I don't know, maybe it's just coincidence, but I feel like that's definitely a very evil yeah. color scheme. But yeah, so he's the perfect profile. She's like not perfectly head on, but she is more so head on than he is, right? Yeah, she's like. And... Go for it. Oh, it's like she even says it. It's like. Uh, I thought you'd have more courage, and it's like, <laughs> he says it perhaps is not a question of courage, but of confidence. Confidence is like, <laughs> that's hilarious. She's expecting him to have more c courage in that like, she, she wants yeah. him to say the things that she wants him to say. But he's uh, she thinks he's too afraid to say those things, but it's not that she, he's not afraid to say them, that he, but he doesn't have the ability to say them. And that's kind of like the wrap up of that whole conversation, which is so hilarious. And then meanwhile, we have the conversation between there's like another man and a woman, right? Also, place was it the husband and the girl? You guys know what I'm talking about? Oh yeah, the in when he's like typing. Yeah, yeah, and it's happening at the same time though. It's like simultaneous. Almost. Mm -hmm. It's like in the I same room, I think. Yeah, yeah, it's the same. Oh, I know what you're talking about now, yeah. Along with the people who are, like, just mindlessly reading off sports results. <laughs> yeah! Well, I think they were, like, transcribing novels, weren't they? Or something. Or they are doing that and, like, reading off sports results. They're just go. They, what is up with those guys? They, they so pulled out, like, I don't know, some, like, Greek philosopher and, like, and he said, blah, blah, blah. And he put it down. It's like, Red Sox up 2-0. to zero. <laughs> Put it down. Yeah, that was uh, pretty good stuff. What what were the point like what who is what was supposed to be doing? I didn't understand. I think I don't know, maybe it was a comment on like mindless consumption of media, I don't know. No, I feel like they uh, maybe this is kinda random, but I feel like they were a, the way they were portrayed seemed in the know. Like they didn't seem like you know, slovenly passive observers or yeah. consumers of media. They seemed like they were there was an element of like irony in what they were doing. I don't know. I can't describe it, but that's just the way I feel. Yeah, I hadn't. I didn't really get a, a grasp on what was going on there. I just thought it was funny. And then yeah. we should probably talk about our main character here. We've done so much justice to this movie. What do we think of Juliet? Just like as a character. Is she a main character? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't even. I wouldn't even go so far as to say that. What? Why? You think? Godard is? I would say there's no yeah, main yeah. character, honestly. <laughs> yeah. I don't even... Oh, she is by far the most central of, like, any character in this movie. She gets the most speaking time, etc. I don't know yeah, if that makes... Yeah, you're trying to analyze it like a normal movie. Yeah, but I don't think you can uh, attribute this as, like, a normal movie. I don't think it's an uh, okay. actual, like, main character. I feel we're getting very caught up in, like, the side. Um, I think a main character requires an actual narrative that creates like an arc for them or at least uh, some kind of progression but this is literally just a snapshot no, of her I'm daily life i'm saying she's literally the main character she is the character we get the most of main sure. yeah i guess this is not important what do we think but of her the main character isn't just like the person we see the most it's the like who has a major purpose i don't think a single character in this like film has like a purpose other than as vehicles for what Godard's, Godard's trying to say, and I think he gives that is, virtually that is purpose, equal. Though. I think virtually every character gets a, about equal that we see. No, that's not true. Because he spreads it out very, I don't know, evenly. See, Derek, we get like ten times more screen time for her than anyone yeah, else. Yeah, but we get like a, a one from her than anybody else. We get like one tenth of I don't know. He says that is, he we says don't get one tenth of the insight. Not, maybe not one tenth, but I would say that. What she says isn't exactly more than what other characters say. Maybe not like per capita, but overall it is. And I don't think she's like the, there's like a primary vehicle of what he's trying to say. I think she has a role of certain things that she's trying to, he's trying to say, like prostitution of the mind or the, your time and stuff like that. 
and like consumerism, but then also like he has other people who talk about like things like I don't know existential and like relations with the society and stuff like that. I really do not understand how you can argue that like she is not the character that we get the most from in terms of content. Yeah, maybe content, but I don't think that relates to purpose. But yeah, but that is con- content is just like purpose, purpose of the film. I don't, I don't think that's how it works in this film, to be honest. Derek, I feel like that is uh, what part. What name that was purposeless? I don't think it's purposeless. I think purpose of this movie is a whole er- essay. Like she has her sections, and then other people have her their sections, and it, it the characters aren't like characters in like a tra- traditional sense. They're not like narratively important to the, uh, like to the per. Uh, they don't have a role in the narrative. They just have their lives that they live and then the things that they do and Godard uses them to say the things that he wants to be said. Yes, I agree with that, but <laughs> he uses her the most. And I don't th- said. And I don't think that traditionally is a main character. I guess traditionally, but I'm just okay. I thought I, this isn't a traditional film. So for non traditional films I think that's like the best way to define main character. It really isn't important. What did you think yeah, of This is not important. <laughs> What do you think of her, Juliet? What do we make of her? She's okay. Yeah. <laughs> like I don't feel like it really like like Derek was saying. Like we can argue all about, about what a main character is and all that BS, but the point is like it doesn't really matter yeah. what she does because like she's just like a a vehicle. She's not like doesn't have that much of her own personality. She's literally just a guard. Let's see, ah, I think that's like a really naive way to view the movie. I mean, the movie's literally called two or three things I know about her. Like, she is obviously, obviously supposed to think something of Juliet. I don't, I disagree with her personality. I think, like, her personality is Godard's personality. It doesn't mean that she's not personality. In fact, that she has a very strong personality, as Godard does. Hmm. I just don't know if it matters all that much. Like, Woody Allen literally plays himself in, like, almost every single movie he makes. <laughs> or he has a character that is basically him. I don't think that makes it any less of, like, a character, you know? Just the fact that it's him. No, that's not why it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because of, in the context no, of the... I think that's not In Look, this movie... So the movie... Okay. The, in, the con- the in the context of the movie, it doesn't matter whether or not we like her or not. But it doesn't matter. How can you say that? I mean, just, I mean, the movie starts with her, right? And it starts with her, and it's um, it's literally examining Juliet, right? We're spying on her. Um, and she's, he's like giving like, like she's like a freaking animal, animal plant. Like now she turns her head to the left, but that means nothing, and all this stuff, you know, he's describing her hair, her life, etc. And it continues throughout her. I mean, maybe it doesn't matter if we like her, but like it's still matters what her actions are and like what she does and decisions she decides to make but i feel like the whole movie is so like conceptual and like not related to like what she's actually doing that it like almost doesn't like but it is what's not she's a prostitute it's like uh we're seeing her for who she is you know what i mean i think that's like kind of harsh to watch and we're seeing someone who is like Maybe it's, like, her passivity that's throwing you guys off. Because she's, like, an extremely passive character, right? Where, like, she's just letting life do whatever it wants to her, you know? Um, to the point where, like, her husband literally tells her, you know, to be a prostitute, and she does it. And my husband's also cheating on her, at least, you know, supposedly. Um, Wait, really? I didn't get that. Yeah, I didn't get that. Something was happening with that girl, right? She's, like, clearly hitting on him. Yeah, but uh, I, I thought it, I didn't think it was implied that he was having sex with her. I don't know. I think at least, if not physically, at least emotionally, they're having a very good conversation. Now that is a man sex right there. I don't think that's a thing in this movie. <laughs> yeah, what do you mean? It's not a thing. She's she, she's not hitting on him. She's not being overtly hitting on him. That's not things. emotionally having sex. And I don't think you're going to emotionally have sex with someone. That's a physical action. Uh, I know some people that would disagree with that. I think a lot of women would disagree with that. I think, like, <laughs> cheating to most women is just as bad as physical cheating, Derek. I do you think you can emotionally answer to somebody? 
Worrying mm-hmm. about emotionally, uh, characters emotionally having sex in a movie and trying to analyze that is kind of, I don't know, unnecessary. Especially Why we... is it unnecessary? I mean, it's just because it's not a traditional narrative film doesn't mean you can't care about characters. I don't understand like, why you guys are like acting like, oh, because it doesn't have a plot, it means the characters really don't matter whatsoever. What was your favorite quote? No, I am not done talking. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. So it begins and ends with this character, right? Mm-hmm. It begins with us analyzing her, and it ends with her kind of having this like dialogue about defining herself. And she literally ends with, define myself, not dead yet. Um, and her person has indifference. So like, she's someone that lets life happen to her, you know? And I think it makes it all the more powerful that, like... What her character is, is the result of, like, life naturally, right? Mm-hmm. Um, this is what happens when you have somebody who, like, I guess doesn't care, you know what I mean? And lets everything happen to her, and this is what happens. You know, if you each didn't fight anything, and I think her character is supposed to, like, reflect society. Like, what happens as we don't fight anything, you know? As we just like let things happen, which is what we are doing as a society, you know what I mean? We're just letting the government do all this stuff, we're just letting things happen. Mm-hmm. And this is at like a more individualistic level. It's, she is what happens when you let things happen. So I think like, almost everything that happens to her is like important to see because it's all what happened to her society, you know, if we just let things occur. Yeah. Anyways, that makes sense. I'm going to watch this movie, guys, again, and I'm going to write a whole essay about it. On this essay film, I'm going to figure this out. Yeah, right. make a video essay, dude. <laughs> a video essay on this video? Make it just you be talking over cool shots of attractive women. We'll do, we'll do. No, but, um... But, okay, favorite quote? Mine's probably either, when I used to dream, it was like being sucked into a great big hole, disappearing down a hole. Now what I dream is like being scattered in a thousand pieces before when I woke up. So good. Even if it took yeah. a while, I'd wake up all at once. Now I'm afraid of missing pieces. When she says it to the boy, I was, I was like, what the fuck? Or uh, when he's like talking to the coffee, since I cannot escape the objectivity crushing me. I was like, wow. Yeah. Man, like, yeah. This movie's kind of hard to analyze without a transcript because so much of it is just like verbal, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mine was, um, art is what gives humanity to forms. Which oh. is pretty interesting. Oh, that's a good one. I don't know if, like, if you think about what art is. Um, I had a couple. I'm trying to choose. Uh, um, I mean, there's like many little quotes that I really resonated with. But I guess my favorite is, um... It's fun here if we could find something to do, which I think like really describes like the human, <laughs> where it's just like it's almost like um once again Woody Allen reference at the beginning of Annie Hall when he's talking about it's like the opposite of like the uh you know the Catskills Mountain Resort where um the food's really bad and it's way too small of portions you know it's yeah. like, right it's like life's all fun but um or like this is really fun if we could just find something to do is I think. Mm-hmm. Very symptomatic. Okay, favorite scene. I like the scene where it replays yeah, like three times, uh, and uh, like I don't know, it's like this rare moment of beauty because he does this thing a lot where he'll be like really deep in like a philosophical tangent, and then all of a sudden music will just come out, and then it's not that much music, and this random music that was come out, and then all of a sudden it would transition to a scene of beauty, and this was like one of the first times that happened. And I think it was like, I don't actually I don't remember what preceded it, but it was anyways. It was kind of dark and really serious, and all of a sudden like these beautiful string, like uplifting strings come in, and then it's this like beautiful and like walking down the street and like kind of across the frame, and then it like replays it several times while she's kind of like thinking, and it was really interesting and beautiful. I'm gonna go see an elephant man where he's uh, reading the Bible verse that was so so strong. Yeah.
Uh, either the nightmare scene that uh, Merrick's has in Elephant Man, or the up close shot of the cigarette in two or three. Those were both just so aesthetic, and in, yep. in their own ways. Yeah. Dude, the... oh. oh, I was just gonna say that the cigarette and then the coffee bubbles, like each by themselves, are just such bangers of scenes. Yeah, like, they really that's are. That's like some 2001 Space Odyssey type shit in terms of like. Just really, really cool shots. Anyhow, favorite performance? Yes. John Hurt, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I agree with that as well. Favorite character is probably all. Awesome. Anthony Hopkins is my favorite actor, but of like all time. But I don't know. John Hurt knocked it out of the park. He did an amazing yeah. job through that prosthetic. I think also my favorite character. So. Yeah. Um, Anthony Hopkins, my favorite character. Merrick. Really? Not Gordon. really. <laughs> Obviously, Elephant Man again. Yeah, yeah. Don Merrick. Merrick. Jesus Christ. Joseph Merrick. Yeah, either way. Not Elephant Man. Is it? Of course not. Okay. And favorite movie. Um, who wants to start? I'll start. I'll start. Oh, go ahead. I'll beat you to it. Uh, <laughs> I pick Elephant Man. Because, I don't know. I pick- uh, I really like the aesthetic, the spooky aesthetic, but then like the contrast of really powerful emotional moments and like I don't know, it was a really beautiful story. Caleb, I pick two or three things. Both of them were super fucking good, um, but I think two or three things had I don't know. It was a little bit like if we're, since we're talking about directors, I think it maybe had a little bit more like of an auteur directorial influence and had a little bit more going forward in terms of like really interesting shots beautiful shots and uh basically film techniques whereas elephant man was like a really clean movie but like didn't really like i don't it it wasn't like very like experimental or like didn't do anything like um surprising i guess you could say yeah, but it did a very, very it was good. very yeah, good directorial. That's, that's not a diss. That's not a diss. That's just me saying that I like two other things more. Slightly. But they're both really good. So it comes down to this again. <laughs> um I'm going to go with Elephant Man. Wow. Strong, very, very strong, but also like I can't help but be like more confused by it than like amazed, but Elephant Man I just thought was like so great from like beginning to end. Mm-hmm. We'll put together and also give me the action. Bless you. Thank you. I'm surprised. I thought it was going to be unanimous for two or three things. Wow. Well, mm-hmm. I really like Elephant Man. I do think two things are very strong. But yeah, just a I bit. I thought you guys were more. Up. What did you say? I said I thought you guys would be more of uh, avant garde boys. I like avant garde things, but I like. Good stories more than video essays. Hey. hey. Which one of you was the one that was shitting on uh, Brunel last time? Uh, that would be uh, Caleb. Caleb, right? Yep. Yeah. Exactly, Caleb. Well, I'm the one. I'm the only one who voted for Exterminating Angel. So avant garde. When you were hating on the Exterminating Angel. That wasn't that avant-garde. That was though. incredibly avant-garde. He's like, okay, but Brunel was just like the definition of like the avant-garde like director. Like, even if it's like maybe not the movie. He yeah. is like, avant-garde. That was pretty avant-garde. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Anyways, so... Um, Lynch wow, we on. did it, guys. We're more than halfway done with the podcast. Barring wow. uh, Loser's Bracket. <laughs> yeah, which... We still have to decide what we're going to do about that. You can tell me your uh, ideas, and we can talk about it. I'm thinking, I'm thinking we'll just move the fork into the winner's bracket, and then you'll the, have to um, and I think, so that would give us 20, right? Mm-hmm. We get down to 5 instead of 4, and then... At that point, I'm thinking whoever has like the lowest cumulative score as we do with the rankings each round is out. Okay. That sounds good. Yeah. 
Okay. Wait, why don't we do six? Uh, we could do that too. I think maybe like another was, but then what we do? Well, then we'll be down to three eventually. Yeah, then it'd be more even than five, or it would be less well, we would... less n- members than five. I mean, I mean, it doesn't matter. It would still have to be down to three, and then the lowest score would be kicked out. Yeah, but it'd be better than like doing five. Yeah, um... sure. I like that. That's no, fine. no, no. I actually, no, 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 no. Hang on, take it back. Because, uh, in my opinion, it makes more sense to kick somebody out based on a point thing further back in the competition. Because, like, you don't want to get somebody – like, it's going to feel really cheap, you know? It that feels cheaper and cheaper three. as you go on. I don't know. It feels cheaper with five because, I don't know, if the, the fifth man out or the one out, like, what if they had the potential to be the second best at the end? Okay. I have an idea. Is ready for this? Yes, hit us. We'll bring it down to five. Okay. And then the bottom two, so five and four, we'll watch their, each of their six best movies. And then we'll talk about their whole kind of thing. We'll do like a special episode for five and four, and the winner will move on. Okay? That way it doesn't feel as cheap in terms of like we're kicking somebody out. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Okay. So we'll watch the six movies, and then we'll analyze everything, and we'll decide which one we think. If only we had, like, planned to have a loser's bracket from the start, because then we could just, like... I mean, we, we still actually... do a loser's bracket. Yeah, we, we could. Oh. No, 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 no. What I mean is, like, if we're doing this, like, losers, like, adding in the losers type thing, like, if we added more directors to this tournament, we can make it so that we could do that, and it would still come down to, like, a, you know, a square or whatever, a power of two. Yeah, but then we're, like, really going deep into wells in terms of, like, uh... Like, I guess, the, how many would we have to add in order? Because it depends on how many losers we're bringing in, right? How many we'd have to add? How many moves you'd have to add? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Or yeah, how many directions would have to add? Yeah. It... Yeah, if I actually we could. Like, awesome. Oh, I just... why don't we add eight? I don't know. Why don't we just do eight? Why would we even do eight? Do eight losers. Like, add eight losers. I just don't want like be just look, watching directors' six best movies that late in the competition. You know what I mean? We wouldn't though. We could just not do losers. It kind of keeps it clean. No, nah, not doing losers is lame. That's boring. Well, anyhow. Okay. Well, I have one more idea that we can do. I mean, you guys, with one more idea that we can go. Uh, but this one's even feels worse. We do our losers, and then we do. Let's so we have our four losers, right? And then the bottom four movie movies, the bottom four scores after we do all this stuff, you know, for our voting for the next podcast. Those four will go up against our four losers. It's kind of like wild card spots, and when are we going to the next round? I like that. Like that idea? Yeah, yeah. that's interesting. But you're saying once we get it down to the top four, they would go up against the other dudes? No, 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 no. That would be really unfair. I'm saying like. So we're gonna do our rankings of everything. So all the movies we we'll have, you know, one first place movie, second place, then thirty second, right? But I have our winners bracket ones. We have one to sixteen, right? Mm-hmm. So we do our top four losers versus our bottom four and winners and put them against each other for a oh, spot okay. in the winners bracket. Yeah, that'd be interesting. Okay, we can do that then. It means we we'll have to watch a couple more six best movies, but at least we don't robbing anyone of like a fourth best, you know, third best, second best. Mm-hmm. Okay. 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 Um. That's it. Have you guys thought about what movie? Do you guys have an idea of what movie you want to go on? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, want, I also uh, think it would smart for us to just do that now. Okay. I want Knights of Kiberia. Or uh, Fellini, I guess, the director. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I think it's fun to talk about this movie. Derek? Charlie Chaplin. Martin Cirovito. Okay. And. I want to make sure that I have... Man, the only reason Kabiria lost is because Matthew's a Woody Allen fanboy. No, it's not, dude. That was a... <laughs> that guy was the better movie. Yeah, it was the better movie for sure. Kabiria was not been... good. Shut up, you didn't even think... You don't think that. I legit think that. Um... I okay. resign the podcast right now. So, I am actually going to go with The Exterminating Angel by Louis Buenau. Just to show how much... Uh... <coughs> No, that's actually the <coughs> second place. Although, actually, Knights of Kibiri, well, I won't get, I won't do it too much. Out of the ones you guys didn't say, it's the highest. Which means, oh, Derek, would you say against the Monster of Rideau? Mm-hmm. 
Eric, your boy Kurosawa. E. You have to try to give one more chance. We'll definitely be going on to some extent, as well as one more side in our fun ranking episode next time we rank all the movies that we have seen so far. Wait, is that um, our next episode? It's going to be a yeah. special edition? Mm-hmm. That sounds fun. Yep, so have your rankings within. Dude, that's going to be a brawl. Holy shit. It really is. Um, no one be too tricky with your things. Don't sabotage. You know, don't rank one movie low so you can get another. I don't know. Don't anything like that. Wait, 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 wait. How are we doing it? We're not just going like, to look at all the movies and just hash it out? No, no. We're each ranking individually. And then we're okay, talking then what's about the podcast? it. What? And then we talk about it. Or then, then, like, don't we all have to vote? Basically, like, we'd have to vote and like. No, no, which everyone has the highest score. So, oh, I guess lowest. So we, it's, you know, let's say. Wait, no, um, no. Why don't we just come up? Why don't we just like sit down and like work out a range? That would literally take forever. There's <laughs> no agree on between two given movies. We can't agree which one is better. There's no way we could agree on all thirty-two. No, I, I think we all agree. It would just be a series of votes, right? We would just like we could go through it like a. That'd be a formula. That's not agreeing. That's just doing what we did before. Yeah, but we're doing it. It's like a, it's like a machine gun round. Like we vote like thirty-two times in one episode. It's badass, dude. That sounds so fun. But then how do we get the? Okay, about this. You guys still need to rank everything. We'll do it like this way, okay, Caleb? Okay. Um, you guys need to rank everything, and then. Uh... Actually, I guess it would probably end up being the same as just individually ranking. It would just yeah. be like more. And the reason I want to do it this way is so you guys don't know it. I want you guys to be surprised and mad at each other once I reveal everything. I already have mine ranked, so I'm not sabotaging anything. Yeah, but then, wait, what's I, the podcast then? What's the I special episode? What is it going to be? Oh, I'll be revealing the total ranking. Isn't that going to take like 10 minutes? No, because we're going to talk about each movie for a bit, you know? Okay. Cool. I'm down. Sounds fun. Okay. Um, so, yeah, you guys send me your rankings. But until next time, I'm Matthew Moore. On behalf of my co host, Caleb Ferks and Derek Krasinski. We are sorry for all the really boring semantic talk in this podcast if for whatever reason you're this far into it. And remember, watch more movies.